Go. Welcome, everyone, to yet another Journal Club uh, brought to you by LEAF, Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, Lifespan.io. I'm Dr. Oliver Medvedek, broadcasting from the Cambar Center for Biomedical Research here at New York City's uh, Cooper Union, uh, which I'm the director of. And joining me is Sven from, um, I don't know where he's physically located, somewhere out there in the world, uh, and Steve Hill. <clears throat> and today we're going to be discussing a journal that, uh, of course, is relevant to aging because all of the articles we pick are relevant to aging. Uh, this is from an open access uh, aging cell. And the article that we're going to be covering is, hold your horses, share the screen, The mitochondrial ATP synthase is a shared drug target for aging and dementia. So this came out fairly recently, this 22nd of November, 2017. Okay, about a year ago, but recent enough. Um, number of authors here, and it's based on some prior work. Um, this is uh, based on uh, characterization of a drug molecule that was pulled out of a screen. Uh, the drug molecule is called J147. And in case you're wondering what uh, J417 is, let me pull up. Uh, can you all see the Wikipedia article on this? J147? Yes. Uh, it appears to be some uh, fluorinated um, phenol ring, benzene ring containing compound uh, of sorts that was pulled out of a screen at candidate. Um, and they were based on two other prior papers. Need um, to resize that, Oliver. Hmm? Resize this. Okay. How about this? Yeah. For some reason, it's it it cuts off at uh, ondrial ATP synthesis, so it's kind uh, of it's cut it at about three quarters of the way across the screen. Okay. Can you see the molecule in the dead center of the screen? No. No. It goes. Oh, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. The, okay. The, the, the chemical. Uh, yep. All right, so let me see if I could uh, just get this paper to uh, let's see, get to be full size. Oh, that's it. That's there, it. Good. Good. All, good. All right, excellent. <clears throat> okay, so this molecule was pulled out of a, a, a previous study, a screen that was a phenotypic study uh, rather than a study that is uh, rather than a screen that's used in, um, I guess. Uh, normally for Alzheimer's candidate drugs where they basically target um, beta amyloid plaques um, or anything else that's normally found to be like tau neurofibrillary tangles or any other type of model system that is, uh, you know, considered to be, um, I guess, uh, an endpoint or, or, or a causative agent of Alzheimer's. Um, in contrast, this molecule was pulled out of a screen that was a phenotypic screen. So basically, they were looking at, it. I believe it was a cytotoxicity screen of sorts. Um, and I don't know exactly what cells they were using, but basically, these were cells that were um, expressing uh, large amounts of uh, these malformed proteins. And they were looking for drug candidates that basically protected or had a protective effect on these cells. So however these candidates protected the cells, uh, not necessarily by directly targeting um, you know, beta amyloid plaques, but however the protection happened where the cells were survived, um, this is how these candidates uh, were identified. And one of these uh, key candidates was J147. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what they do in this paper by Goldberg et al. is they try to characterize J147 as to what its mechani mechanism of action is um, exactly. So that is basically, you know, fundamentally what this paper is about. Um, and they, the other key thing that they do in this paper is they uh, tie together, or they attempt to tie together with a series of experiments later, uh, purporting to show a connection between um, neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's or, you know, uh, agents that potentially can cause Alzheimer's like um, beta amyloid plaques and um, aging in general. Um, via the um, TOR signaling pathway. Uh, so I don't know if this may be one of the first papers or a few papers or a few papers out there that makes this connection, but this molecule, uh, they go on to demonstrate um, 
targets um, things, targets uh, proteins that play a role in uh, both pathways or, or certainly play a role in the pathology of, you know, of dementia and also, um, pat and also uh, targeting proteins such as um, uh, that affect TOR, which affect aging in general. So this drug molecule has broad implications. So um, this is good. So kind of the big picture view of this is that, uh, you know, potentially molecules that you find that can, you know, target uh, Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, they might have a, you know, uh, cell protective effect and anti-aging effect in general. So uh, that's certainly at least also leads credence to the view that, you know, that aging is a very interconnected phenomena and that, you know, inflammation and inflammation and aging in general is a driving force of any diseases of aging, obviously, but certainly things like Alzheimer's. So uh, let's go back to the paper. Always get the screen share off. Okay. Okay. So let's scroll through and see what we have. Okay. So what do they do first? Um, how do they find out what this uh, molecule actually interacts with? Well, there's this um, interesting um, experiment that has a acronym called DARTS. Uh, I forgot what it stands for. They should say it right here. DARTS, Drug Affinity Responsive Target Stability, which is further covered in Lominic et al. 2011. You can look that up. That's in the paper. Um, and what this basically is, is I'm scrolling down to figure one, is a way to identify what uh, drug molecules interact with particularly protein targets um, because due, due to this interaction um, the protein structure is stabilized somewhat um, it's less flexible and is hence less um, accessible to proteases so if you um, use this darts procedure and you treat with proteases I believe they use pronase in this study um, anything that doesn't get sufficiently degraded within the, with the treatment, you know, of your drug uh, target is potentially something that your drug is interacting with strongly. So they had to do a number of protein gels here. So in figure one, they look at target identification by darts and affinity precipitation pull downs. So all protein jargon, um, you know, dealing with uh, isolating proteins. And here we have a gel up here. So an acrylamide gel, molecular weight standards. So uh, a lot of the figures here are, you know, your basic molecular biology. Um, you have your controls, uh, DMSO, which is your vehicle, whatever your J147 is dissolved in. Um, and this is a whole cell lysate. Uh, what do they use here? H2, HT22 cells. Um, I can look that up later and see what exactly which, what the derivative of these cells are. But they treat it with uh, 10 micromolar J147. Um, so I guess they do this in duplicate, then they have higher concentrations, 50 micromolar, and this is um, staining, and later, then, no doubt, they do Western analysis to identify what these uh, blobs are more specifically, and this blob here, which is enhanced with higher levels of G147, is ATP5A. So uh, ATP5A happens to be a catalytic subunit of the ATP synthase, uh, which is uh, found in mitochondria. So it's a mitochondrial ATP synthase. And ATP synthases are, um, well, in case you've never seen the structure of an ATP synthase, they are quite beautiful. Uh, I'm just going to Google this. Spell this, I know. Images. Um, they kind of look like an inverted lollipop. Let's take a look at this one here. Oops. Uh, can we image. Is that coming in for everybody? Yeah, it looks okay to me. Um, I've got a big screen, but it's still readable. Okay. All right, so you've got this kind of orange, so you can see this orange thing and this green thing, so you have this stator here, and you've got this rotor. Basically, this is what generates the bulk of the adenosine triphosphate, the energy molecule in your body, right? So here are a bunch of subunits, and these are the catalytic subunits up here, and this is a, this gamma subunit, and all of these are a, a rotor. This basically spins around um, as protons basically go down um, a gradient, right? So this is the membrane potential in your mitochondria. Uh, 
So here they say exoplasmic, cytoplasmic. So these are found also in, in, in bacterial membranes as well. And as the proton gradient goes down, this rotate, there's a little shaft here that rotates around. <clears throat> these subunits undergo conformational changes, and as they do so, it basically squeezes phosphates on ADP and cranks out ATP. So uh, that's how it functions. So this drug targets a catalytic subunit, probably something here, I believe, um, in the stator where um, the catalysis happens. Um, I don't know exactly where J147 binds exactly, precisely. Um, but that's the target. So let's go back to paper. So that's what they found, ATP5A. Um, and they further, you know, um, want to see, you know, uh, just double check that this is what it's really binding. So they do a no, no, number of uh, backups, uh, you know, um, experiments where they do what's called a pull down assay. So they do um, essentially you get. Um, this little chemical biotin, which binds tightly to a protein called avidin or streptavidin, found in um, bacteria, and it um, this is this little chemical you can tag onto other chemicals like here J one four seven, and basically, uh, if you have anything bind to J one four seven, it'll bind biotin will bind to avidin. Avidin is stuck to a bead that has a certain density, and then you could spin that down. And basically, you could pull down things from a supernatant or a soup that basically come along for the ride. And, you know, um, very nicely here, you could see that, you know, what comes down, not just ATP5B, but you get a lot of other stuff that's actually associated with, um, you know, uh, I believe the electron transport chain, um, other subunits of AT, you know, of ATP synthase. Um, Export and important, and ATP five A and another assay comes down as well. And they, this assay here, they basically um, do a competitive assay where they add in BJ one uh, non biotinylated, I believe, um, some beads biotin alone. Oh, and J one four seven non biotinylated J one four seven. And that basically is it outcompetes the biotinylated J147. So it shows it, it competes and can basically break the, the binding of J, the J147 with ATP5A. So basically, all of this biochemistry, um, molecular biology is highly suggestive, strongly supports you know, the, uh, the, the, you know, the observations here that this is the binding partner. And um, it could be binding to other things, but it appears ATP5A is kind of the key, uh, key catalytic, you know, um, enzyme that J147 actually interacts with. Okay, so I'll stop sharing here for a moment. Um, show my face for a little while, because uh, I've been told it's a good protocol to switch back and forth. Um, take any questions? Yeah. Popular demand uh, that people have uh, requested your face on popular demand, Oliver. Oh. Um, just, just to uh, just to go back to ATP. Oh. Um, probably what a lot of people may associate with ATP is the NAD cycle, the the, the NAD scavenging cycle, mm -hmm. which I understand is happens before the generation of ATP. Not quite sure how, where it fits in, but I, I do know that NAD ends up facilitating the, the, the mitochondria to produce yeah. ATP. Yeah, well, that's, that's, I mean, all of that stuff is, is crucial for energy production. So basically, you can imagine NAD and NADH, um, they're basically uh, there to facilitate redox reactions, reduction oxidation, which is basically just the shuttling of electrons. So basically, NAD is, uh, is and, it's, um, and it's, you know, um, reduced variant NADH and all the other variants thereof, like FAD and so on and so forth, they basically act as a bucket brigade for electrons. So you eat food, you strip electrons off the food, protons also come off, and those electrons, um, those electrons basically are, you know, are uh, transported to the electron transport chain. You know, your, your, Krebs, your Krebs cycle, your citric acid cycle, which does all this, that's, that's basically what it's churning out. It's churning out primarily, um, you know, uh, the reduced equivalents of NAD, NADH, and those, those electrons are then fed to the electron transport chain. Um, and those, like, 
those high energy electrons are basically what drive the pumping of protons across that gradient. So that picture that we saw uh, earlier, go back to share screen. The helicopter. Helicopter, yeah, share screen. Let's see where ATP synthase, I call it a lollipop, um, inverted lollipop. But basically this, where these, where these proton, the, this gradient of protons is initially established by a, by an electron transport chain. I mean, those electrons basically are based. You don't see this here; it's not shown. Um, but that chain of the, that um, the electrons flowing down their their energy gradient basically causes a whole bunch of other proteins to essentially move protons to one side, and that which generates the membrane potential, right? The pH potential that's found in. In the between the inner and outer membranes of the mitochondria, or between the matrix and the uh, inner membrane space of the mitochondria, and then that can be set to work, right? So if this is basically, um, so this would actually be inside of the matrix. This would be the inner mitochondrial uh, space. So these protons would then flow back, right? So it's basically the bucket brigade causes the pumping of protons, and those protons basically can now, after they've build up on the other side of the dam that can flow back down and you know every couple of protons flowing across I forget how many causes this thing to rotate you know 120 degree increments and each 120 degree increment increment pops out in ATP right um, there's been a number of really really interesting experiments done back in the 90s where they've actually analyzed the torque on this by really beautiful experiments where they've tethered an actin tail to these catalytic subunits as they rotate around and this tail basically spins around fluorescently and then they were able to measure based on the size of the actin tail how much torque is generated and they were able to then back calculate what the what the you know newtons or nanonewtons of piconewtons of force were and it turns out that the experimental calculations almost exactly correlated with the theoretical calculations of how much ATP is being generated so I think people have a fair understanding of how this thing works it's very cool isn't it yeah and it, it, it sort of highlights the fact that the NAD and ATP cycle is is very intrinsically linked to aging and Obviously, as you get older, ATPs and NAD levels do fall, and it ties in really with uh, research by people like David Sinclair, who are seeking to actually restore the NAD levels to a more sort of youthful level. So I suppose if this is what this is doing as well, it is very much uh, addressing aging in a direct manner. Yeah, I mean, there. I mean, this is this is a direct link. I mean, you know. Um, NAD and ATP go together like chocolate and peanut butter, I guess. Quote an old commercial. I don't but know if you remember good, that. I don't remember that, but I do like chocolate and peanut butter. So uh, I, you know. Reese's peanut butter cups, chocolate and peanut butter. Yeah, they sell these here in the UK now as well. So, yes, I do like those. Uh, we've got oh. a question here. Yeah. Hello, in which relation are mitochondria and amyloids? which are responsible for Alzheimer's? Well, I mean, directly responsible people would probably say, you know, amyloids, amyloid flax, but in I mean, you know, I mean, one, go for it, Steve. I know what you're going to say. And, and tradition, the traditional view of Alzheimer's research is very much being on beta and tau trying to remove those. Um, but research like this, and, and other works that I've seen are sort of more and more suggesting that, that that's just really a consequence. And it's the processes like pro loss of proteostasis and things like that that are happening before that, that is, that should be the focus. Then these tau, these misfolded amyloids wouldn't accrue in the first place. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I knew where you were going to go with that. Yeah, I was basically going to, you know, repeat what you said but basically just say you know it's it's right epistatic one is before the other right one link leads to the other so it's sort of like a chain of events um you know maybe the final cons final consequence is, is neurotoxicity right and 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 improper connections with your ax axons and then before that is probably neurofibrillary tangles beta amyloid plaques all of that stuff and then before that are all the other things that lead to these things you know being um you know the accelerated you know, um, appearance of these things. So, 
So there is a chain of events. So if you can stop things early on, that's great. I mean, obviously you then need to clear out the damage that's already been done, but you need to also address if there's any types of malfunctions happening earlier. Otherwise you're going to just build up some more plaques again. So Yeah, it will just happen again. And it, it very much ties into what people like uh, Aubrey de Grey and Hallmarks of Aging have been saying for a long time now that it's the pathological processes that uh, of aging are actually not given disease names but in a very real sense they can be considered targets for treatment and are likely to be more effective than actually dealing with the consequences which in general modern medicine or current medicine tends to do trying to slap a band-aid over the top of something when the underlying damage goes unaddressed that's why i found j147 so interesting because it 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 takes a step back from the consequence and looks at the root Mm -hmm. um although we probably have questions later as to exactly how that's happening but you know i mean every paper always generates more questions right that's that's what all papers do well, we'd be in trouble if we ran out of questions, wouldn't we? I mean, what else would we do on a Sunday afternoon? I would just be hanging out at some island, I guess. I don't, I don't think we'll ever exhaust uh, the, the, the amount of scientific possibilities in the universe. And that's a good thing, you know? No, don't say that. I want there to be answered everything just around the corner. I want there to be the, what's the term? The, what's the term that, uh, what's that guy uses? The uh, singularity. I want that to happen now immediately anyway um <clears throat> okay so back to reality uh figure two um so now they are appear. now they're looking at what this so now that they you know have ascertained to their uh i guess um i guess they're satisfied that it's interacting with what it's interacting with uh now they're seeing, well, if that's what it's interacting with, what are the consequences of this, right? So we have a whole figure here basically looking at mitochondrial bioenergetics, right? Because that's what this ATP synthase does. It's, it's tied directly to mitochondrial bioenergetics. And um, they look at a number of different things. They look at ATP synthase activity, um, and they show that it's an inhibitor, but doesn't fully inhibit it. They mentioned that it could be allosteric, meaning that it doesn't, um, it might bind to a side, site outside of its catalytic site. So they seem to keep adding until they, you know, they go up to 1,000 nanomolar and it's dropping the activity down to roughly, you know, 70 to 80% of its value. Um, I don't exactly know how they did the activity assay. It's somewhere in the materials and methods, um, the ATP synthase activity assay. Um, but they also do localization studies where I believe they use probably biotinylated J147 and antibodies or probably, um, you know, some sort of fluorescein labeled avidin to label it. And they show that it's uh, found in mitochondria. So these proteins that are found in mitochondria, COX-4, um, this is BJ147. And they show that you can see these yellow speckles. It's, you know, I guess it's co-localizing to mitochondria. Are perhaps they could zoom in a little bit more. These are kind of small. Um, uh, what's the scale on this thing? Uh, mitochondria is red. I don't know what the scale of this thing is. Uh, what size? This is in microns. Um, but I guess this dark thing is probably the nucleus. Probably makes sense. That's the nucleus and these are the mitochondria. Um, but anyway, that's that's what they use to show co-localization, right? Um, you also use a fluorescence-based assay to show uh, C, which is basically mitochondrial polarity. Um, and this is a measure of so the polarity is basically a measure of um, that concentration gradient I spoke about which is basically you have, a, you have a polarity, you have a membrane potential, right? Um, so the membrane potential in this case, uh, it should. So if they're knocking out ATP synthase, the membrane potential should go up because what ATP synthase is doing is obviously is, you know, it's 
dropping the potential as it's working, right? So you have elect you have protons coming back down the gradient. So if you stop ATP synthase activity from happening, then the potential should slowly rise, right? Showing that basically you're kind of putting a blockage on, on ATP synthase activity. Um, they do a number of other tests here that correlate with bioenergetics and, you know, and the consequences of what would happen if you knock down ATP5A. So they don't just use, um, they don't just use J147, but they say, well, okay, well, if it's a consequence of knocking down ATP5A, then J147 shouldn't be the only thing. We should be able to also knock it down using siRNA for some other treatment. Um, so here we have H22 cells, uh, you know, to show that their siRNA is working relative to acting controls. You see the levels go down considerably. And, you know, again, these little stars show that this is all um, statistically significant. Uh, take that as you will. I mean, big overlapping error bars. And, you know, you're seeing what I'm seeing here. Um, but, you know, the claim is that uh, you're getting hyperpolarization also happen here. Um, and also superoxide levels go up, which is a consequence of, of this. They're saying that's necess not necessarily a bad thing. Superoxide is also used as a signaling you know, mechanism in mitochondria. Um, whole cell ATP levels. Um, you know, this is, so this is kind of interesting here in that um, uh, I'm not sure what the explanation is exactly for this, which is that the host cell ATP levels are going up. I mean, again, granted, it's not really a lot, but um, you are slowing down, you know, by 20% or stopping by 20% of the activity of ATP synthase, but the ATP levels go up. Um, and I'm not sure what's accounting for that. Um, and then I don't remember if they mentioned that in the paper. You guys remember that? No, but I, I don't remember them discussing any of that in the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so they used FCCP as a negative control. Uh, I knew what it was, I forgot. Uh, obviously it was an inhibitor. Um, I'm not going to say it's, uh, I'm just going to Google that right now, unashamedly, because, you know, what the hell. It's not the fellow College of Chess Physicians. Um, it is... Under that. Huh? Carbonyl cyanide. Yeah. Um, oh, cyanide. Okay, so it's going to inhibit the electron transport chain, probably. So that would stop ATP synthesis right in its tracks. Um, if it's if it's it's an uncoupler from yeah. what I saw. Yes. Right. So if it if it yeah. So then so then that's gonna that's that's a negative control. But I don't know why slightly inhibiting. You know, maybe somebody on if listening um, to fill me in. I don't know why slightly inhibiting ATP five A is going to cause levels of ATP to creep up unless there's some sort of compensatory mechanism. You know, that's what it seems like. But I'm not sure what that would be. Uh, uh cool. Couldn't it be that it inhibits any reverse, uh, you know, action of the enzyme where it breaks ATP to ADP, MPI? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, I guess, I mean, I don't know if that, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not, I know, obviously, the ATP synthase, like every enzyme can go backwards and forwards. Um, but I don't know if that's normal inside of the context of mitochondria. Um, if, if that's a problem, if, you know, if there's, if that's, uh, if that's really a mechanism that, you know, I've never heard of that as a mechanism being used within the context of living cells that they're frequently the F1 ATPase synthase actually goes in reverse, you know, and starts breaking apart ATP to generate more ADP. Um, and that this somehow inhibits that backward reaction. Um, I, yeah, I, prob probably it actually shouldn't happen, I think, because, yeah, uh, I don't think, yeah, yeah, I have no clue. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment here. Um, so that's where we're at at this point, if there's any questions, but um, certainly it's doing something interesting uh, with 
in the context of mitochondrial bioenergetics. Um, evidently slowing down or slightly inhibiting, you know, uh, that this particular ATP uh, synthase is a good thing within the context of this pathology. Um, if that's the only thing J147 is doing, obviously, could be doing to be doing a lot of other things as well. But this is this is the one thing that they seem to be pinpointing. All right, let's go back to the paper. Okay, so then now they're looking at neuroprotective effects. Um, so knockdown of ATP 5A figure three phenocopies, the neuroprotective effects of J147. Uh, so they're looking at, uh, well, they're looking at a number of things that lead to neurotoxicity. Um, and figure 3A, and this is something Sven with his laser sharp eyes have caught, could potentially be a typo, maybe, I'm not sure. but. Um, so in figure 3A, they look at these MC65 cells, which are um, these cells that have been basically um, created that have this uh, uh, small protein that's a beta amyloid, I think it's C99 uh, peptide that builds up and causes uh, neurotoxicity um, in, in response to tetracycline. So tetracycline turns on the promoter, which causes this peptide to be synthesized and causes cells to basically choke to death. So um, <clears throat> here they do ATP5A knockdown using siRNA. So here's just a control blot. You can see actin um, control, uh, which just tells you that's been loaded carefully normally. No siRNA, siRNA, no siRNA, siRNA, and this is addition of tetracycline, and this is no J147, um, and this is amyloid proteotoxicity. So they, they do a cell survival assay, so they probably stain cells that died. And um, I believe these, this here, um, these legends here, which are left out, um, must correlate to the same thing here, um, which is that the top line is, uh, ATP5, ASI, RNA. This is the addition or not of tetracycline, meaning the turning on of these uh, small C99 peptides, which are, which are basically um, neurotoxic, or the addition of J147, which should prevent that from happening. Now, I'll just start from this end here, which makes more sense. So if you um, knock down ATP5A, and you add J147, and there's no tetracycline, well, the cells are doing pretty well. Um, you have J147, but no tetracycline and no ATP5 knockdown. Again, they're doing pretty well. Um, ATP5 knockdown, no tetracycline, no J147. They're doing pretty well. So these are all positive controls, basically. Um, but this is what doesn't make sense. Uh, if, if this is correct, then... Um, Churning out neurotoxic peptides protects the cells, and getting rid of them makes them sur makes them die. So, I don't know. I think that should be the other way around, personally. Um, I'm just looking at these. What this is? Is that correct, Sven? You got you got the same kind of notice there. Yes, that was exactly what I didn't understand. Yeah, I'm thinking it's a typo. I'm, I'm just I'm just. Just because, you know, this thing is shifted down here, so, you know, who knows? It's, you know, this could have just been kind of mixed up or something. Um, because otherwise it makes no sense whatsoever. And the take-home message is that we should inject ourselves with C99 peptides, which probably <laughs> is not a good idea. Um, so I'm going to assume that it's a typo, and maybe there, maybe there was a, uh, I'm sure, maybe if we go into Google, maybe we'll find that there was an error correction. Either that or it absolutely turns everything we know about biology upside down, right? Yeah, based on figure 3A. <laughs> yeah. It's probably a typo. Um, it's, it's actually amazing how, uh, how many typos and little errors do, do make it through the net, really. Yeah, you know. It's, it's scary, really. <laughs> Especially with medicine, right? Right. Well, even if there's even if there's no even if there's no typos, right? Even if there's no typos, some you know, like p-values themselves, right? If a 
if everybody says, oh, it's a p-value of 0.05, right? That means if everybody did all their statistics 100% correct, that means 5% of papers are irreproducible garbage, <laughs> you know, just just based on things being done properly, right? So, yeah. There's some great papers out there, though. I did I did have a laugh about um, it. It was uh, it was a paper recently, uh, end of last year, I think it was, and it was on about um, uh, Wookies and things from star wars and it actually managed to get into a journal i'm like what <laughs> it's amazing what's in journals isn't it well i mean the term journal is rather broad right i mean could could be some postmodern pablum <laughs> but it was a it was a detail it was a detailed scientific discussion about uh wookies and and well and, there was and, um a paper in a physiology journal i think it was where they actually measured the number of times Darth Vader breathed a minute and correlated with his activity level of him walking around. The number of what? The times he breathes. Oh. So to see how his respiratory system is functioning. Well, all I know is that, according to South Park, you know, the fact that Wookiees come from the planet of Endor does not make any sense. Or something like that. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> uh, let's get back to the paper. Um, uh, all right. Um, so I'm going to have to uh, refresh myself with these images, these figures here. So, uh, and some of these con chemicals they use here because I'm, I'm getting a little hazy. I read this paper a little while ago. Um, so these are all uh, protection against energy loss, uh, protection against glutathione depletion, C, uh, and trying to, trying to remind myself of the connection of what glutamate induced oxytocin has to do with energy uh, with with um energy regulation or is this just general cytotoxicity or other cytotoxicity models um yeah i think the gluc glutamate is just another type of uh, neurotoxic uh, thing it's a very well known um mm -hmm. excitatory uh, toxicity mechanism mm -hmm. and I don't know if that is at all related to energy metabolism. Right. It's to do with, um, it's, it's, it's to do with the type of overstimulation in the brain called excitotoxy, uh, excitotoxy uh -huh. um, which is something I touch upon occasionally um, in because I study and write about uh, the pharmacology of plants, like polyphenols, and quite a few of them can actually uh, reduce the, uh, the level of excitotoxy in the brain. Oh. Which is a good thing because um, it helps combat things like depression and and things and, and, and neurological dis disorders potentially. I see. What uh, it's doing here is I don't know. <laughs> uh, they mentioned that in the paper uh, somewhere. Obviously, they mentioned the paper. Um, IAA. Um, too many acronyms for me. IAA. Iodic acetic acid. It's an in also depletes energy somehow. It's I, I isn't it like um glycolytic inhibitor, I think? Ah uh, yes, yes. It's an inhibitor of glycolysis, right? So it's gonna drop the production of energy considerably because obviously you need glycolysis as a precursor to feed stuff into, you know, your mitochondria. Um and IF one overexpression. Trying to looking at so many different things here. Um, is IF1, I can't remember what IF1 overexpression is supposed to boost. That's supposed to lower the levels of, of these neurotoxic peptides. Uh, I mentioned that. Yeah, I found it. It's uh, ATPs, ATPase inhibitor factor one. ATPase inhibitor factor one. Factor one. It's an endogenous inhibitor. Let's see. Okay, so is that supposed? To, okay. Let's 
So addition of ATP 5A siRNA by dropping ATP 5A levels um, is protective against, I guess, all of these insults that are being thrown at the cell. Figure B, figure C. Um, they mention uh, figure D. Let's see what they have here. Um, Figure D, they use ATP 5A siRNA um, and also increasing concentrations of J147, uh, which is also protective. Um, J147 protection against energy loss is needed by ATP 5A. Um, so this is cell survival in 10 micromolar IAA. Again, ATP 5A siRNA and con control and increasing concentrations of J147 uh, compound. Um, They mentioned one thing though, ATP 5A knockdown does not provide an additive effect, right? J147 protection during oxytocin and IA toxicity. So I guess the take home message is that they're trying to conclude here that J147 and A is basically functioning by lowering the levels of ATP 5A or, or lowering the activity of ATP 5A, which would be comparable to lowering the levels thereof by using an siRNA. Um, treatment. Um, so they're kind of correlating the two as being uh, interchangeable. Okay, stop sharing here for a little while. More IF1 is good then, really. Um, but it is no surprise, it's a master regulator of energy metabolism and it also influences um, cell death mm -hmm. or apoptosis. So is it a surprise that the more of it, the better things get? Because that's what IF1 does. You can never get enough IF1 or ATP, you know? Hmm. Well, okay. you probably can, but you'd be hard pushed to actually produce that much ATP, I would think. Yeah, probably. More ATP, the better, I guess. Um... Well, to a point, I suppose. Oh, apparently um, we have a correction for you, Oliver. Oh. Uh, Wookiees don't come from Endor. They come from uh, Kyashik. Oh. Let's excuse my Wookiee. I'm, I'm not, not good at pronouncing, but apparently, um, yeah, they're not from Endor. That makes sense. Ewoks are from Endor. Thank you. That's, that's right, yeah. There'd be some <laughs> pretty strange things going on if the little bears and the... Oh, never mind. No, <laughs> I'll go in there. Okay, uh, let's go back to paper uh, share screen. Okay, now they start doing some more interesting things. So, you know, I, I, think, I think they've done a pretty good job of convincing us that there's an interaction happening between ATP 5A synthase and this J147 compound um, and it's got something something happening to, to bioenergetics hmm. um, and that this may may be you know that this may be uh, what's involved in these neuroprotective effects um, now the second kind of part they sort of shift gears here and they try to connect this with um, aging in general which is um, AMP, K, and mTOR signal, um, which basically is a huge kind of, you know, um, well, hugely important pathway for metabolism um, and energy usage in a cell. Um, AMPK is basically like a, you know, um, I think a, a nexus point sort of um, this AMP kinase for um, sensing energy levels in the cell. Um, and uh, this pathway basically is... Uh, Downstream of it are things such as mTOR, which is the famous target of rapamycin. And um, this is responsible for a number of things, uh, among them uh, turning on protein synthesis. So uh, things that inhibit TOR um, tend to have a beneficial effect on lifespan, right? Things that stimulate AMPK have a beneficial effect. AMPK will inhibit um, mTOR. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things downstream, um, such as they look at Raptor, S6, ACC1, um, that are affected by um, AMP kinase. 
Um, so these proteins here, you know, they're activated by being phosphorylated. That's what a kinase does. A kinase is basically a protein that phosphorylates other proteins, and then you have, it acts as a little switching mechanism that causes that protein to perform another function. Uh, it turns it on and needs that protein out and activate another protein or repress another protein. Um, and then eventually you have downstream, uh, your downstream consequences, you know, like increased protein production, for example. So uh, they wanted to look at, well, what happens to this signaling pathway if we put in J147, to use these cells again, HT22 and MC65, MC65 cells. Those are the cells that I believe that we were, um, let's go back to, let's go to the materials and methods, actually pull up these cells and what the heck they exactly are. So I'm just saying, I just scroll through the of these things. Um, Inspections, Western blots. Darts. Cell lines. Um, HT22 and human MC65 are neuronal cell lines. Um, yeah. And this amyloid. This induction of intracellular amyloid toxicity was in these MC65 human neuronal cell lines. Okay, so they're neuronal cell lines. Um, let's go back. Sorry, the computer is slow here, scrolling. Okay, so, ah, oh God, sorry. It's like, some lag here, the scroll. Scroll, pause, scroll, pause. Okay, there it is. Uh, so what is this, figure four? Figure five, figure four. Figure four. I'm not daring scrolling down because I'm gonna lose everything. Um, anyway, it's the figure that looks at the phosphorylation status of uh, components that are upstream of the tor. Um, and what you're seeing here is basically a Western blot against antibodies against these various proteins. Um, and the addition of J147 is added, and then there's these time points here. I think this is in minutes, zero minutes. So I guess either they add it and it's immediate or they don't add it, I'm not sure. But then they wait 10 minutes and 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 120 minutes, so on and so forth. And down here is an acting control, a loading control. Um, here, fold relative change to zero. So this is interesting. This is basically the fold level of changes in the phosphorylation status um, from basically, uh, you know, so here you see P, A, and P, K, P, S, 6. So phosphorylated AMP is activated, which is a good thing for in the context of aging, and phosphorylated S6 is also a good thing, and Raptor as well, I believe, or S6 is now, sorry, it's a, it's a bad thing. I have to pull up the pathway. Let me pull up the AMP signal. Um, S, um, S6 is downstream of uh, mTOR, so when yeah, mTOR yeah. is active, mm -hmm. it's also active. That is correct. So AMP signaling, so trying to pick up a should have had this ready, but let me see, AMPK and mTOR, so we could see the, see the flow of things. Um, I'm trying to find a figure here that's got all of this nicely wrapped up. I did, and then I lost it, AMPK and mTOR. Uh, bear with me for one moment here. As, uh, a, as a slight aside, it's interesting to note that the interactions of this also touch upon the same sorts of things that caloric restriction and things like that also influence mm -hmm, exactly so, you know i mean at a rough guess I, I wouldn't be surprised if i reviewed some of the caloric restriction data to find out it might have neuroprotective benefits as well because after all it is influencing some of the same pathways well, I mean, it's well known that calorie restriction is neuroprotective and protects against um, uh, uh, amyloid beta pathology. Mm. So, so here's uh, a uh, uh, metformin, of course, is also an EMPK activator. So, can, sorry, can you see this pathway here? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. So here's some. There's a bunch of other components here. Obviously, this is this is still not. Uh, <laughs> this is a very stripped down pathway. There's a lot of other things interacting, but you know, just to show you the, you know, the the epistasis here of what's going on, like what's what's behind what. Here's AMPK. Here's this TSC1, and then there's inhibition of TOR. Here's TOR, and then TOR is activating S6K. So obviously, turning this on will cause you know. Um, this to be turned on, which will inhibit TOR, and then, you know, TOR activates this, which is required for protein synthesis and cell growth. So, um, so you can see here, you know, what is the good things that you want to basically slow down, which would be basically TOR and anything downstream of TOR. So, okay, let's go back to, go back to this figure. Okay. Um, so a bit of, methodology here so again like the way they're doing this you know again i'm i have to kind of think about it a little hard as to if that's kind of the, the right control because uh so their their control is from my understanding i have to look at the assay but it's still j147 is there it's just zero minutes uh there's no control with no j147 right and the longer these things are in this assay from zero minutes to 480 minutes, the phosphorylation status goes up, right? Um, here it's doing something weird. It starts high, dips down, then goes back up again, which I'm not sure what the deal with that is. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what's going, going on here. Um, S6, it looks like it's going down. Here, which, you know, I guess if you, you know, I'm assuming, so here are some assumptions. I'm assuming this is all normalized to actin levels, right? I'm assuming that this is all normalized and, you know, and it, because you have to obviously be careful when you compare the intensity of these, these blobs that, you know, that you, you have normalized values, right? Because you want to actually show that it's not, you just don't have more protein in general, but you have more phosphorylated protein. Um, you know, again, I'm just going to toss this out there. I'm sure they've done the controls, but, you know, what would happen if you just had these cells sitting in the assay for 480 minutes? Does phosphorylation status just go up, you know, if you have these cells sitting around in, in whatever assay state you have um, without the addition of J4, J147? Um, because again, the control here is full relative change to zero minutes. So that's, that's the control, right? It's not the lack of J417, it's zero minutes at the beginning of assay versus throughout the assay. So, um, so that's, that's what's being measured, right? Um, so based on that, this is where you get these you know, these fold relative changes happening over time. And, you know, and I guess, you know, from a kind of a broad picture, you know, if, if that's what's happening, then okay, phosphorylated AMPK goes up, um, you know, phosphorylated S6, which is downstream of TOR goes down, and then, you know, these also go up, which are activated by AMPK, and you have a similar effect happening here, similar but different, because you got this weird dip happening between five and 60 minutes. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure what's going on over there. Um, but that's, this is sort of, you know, this is, this is important because this is their kind of major data that shows that they're, you know, strongly suggesting that this is the connection between J147 and AMPK mTOR signaling, right? That's, that's some, one of their, key bits of data. Um, over here, they now basically do the same thing, but they use now um, siRNA. So again, you know, if J147, just based like on the previous figures, if, if J147 is doing this by inhibiting the activity of this, um, you know, uh, AMP, ATP5A, and that's what's causing this, then we should get the same recapitulation by adding um, siRNA. Uh, which supposedly is, is the case, um, you know, we have 
Uh, control sRNA, ATP5, ARNA, I don't know what the time points are here. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to see, right? I mean, you have to really, this is full change relative to control sRNA, and they compare this now not to zero minutes, uh, 480 minutes, but, you know, as a normalization, you use this gap DH, which is, uh, you know, a protein that is not supposed to be changing, uh, you know, a general so-called housekeeping enzyme that's not going to be changing, and that's basically um, used to, you know, normalize the values of these non-phosphorylated uh, AMPKs and these, you know, phosphorylated AMPKs, and then you're comparing, you know, phospho and total. Now, for the normalized values, you're comparing, you know, this versus this, the relative intensities. Um, again, just a caveat with these with these Western blots, um, you have to make sure that this is within the linear range, right? I mean, because this is, you know, this is like, I don't know if this is radiography film or, or what, but you can totally saturate this, right? And then, and then you've got it super, super saturated with, with the blob, and that can show you that there's no change when there is a change. It's just that you, you've basically gone beyond the linear range of this detection method. Um, so you just have to be careful with that. Um, so if they've controlled for all of that, then basically what they're seeing is a similar effect as to what they saw, um, as what they saw in the J147 um, data. Um, and you know, again, and this this figure four is their key figure that they're basically alluding to to tell you that J147 is connecting, you know. Um, AMPK and the TOR pathway and TOR signaling with the neuroprotective effects and the inhibition of ATP5K. So um, personally, you know, I'd like to see some more stuff, you know, done to really kind of nail down that this is really, really, you know, J147 is also is really having an effect on, you know, uh, AMPK mediated signaling. Um, but, but this, you know, but this is their, this is their key figure that is, um, suggesting that to them and to the readers. So anyway, stop sharing for a minute. Uh, oops. There I am. Any questions about that? Just gonna have a look. Please hold one moment. Your call is important to us. But yeah, if it does happen to pan out that that's the case, that connection is the case, then it's influencing not only one underlying aging process but two mm -hmm. which is uh, which is very interesting uh, indeed uh, let's have a look no nothing at the moment um, but people are welcome to ask questions if they if they'd like please do uh, get involved Oliver loves lots of questions especially the hard ones right Oliver yeah I mean the one about the yeah, the one with the Wikimon working really I screwed that one up. Yes, perhaps we should do. Uh, perhaps we should do a, a fun journal club at some time and um, just review the most uh, amusing papers that we can find. That might be. Uh, that might be a, a, a Christmas special. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not like the god awful Christmas special that I'm thinking about. Ah, yeah, you picked up on the reference. But yeah, yes, not. not I don't think anything is quite as bad as the Star Wars Christmas special. Oh, that was bad. That was terrible. I yeah. think it was like what nineteen. It was the early eighties, I think, or mid eighties. Yeah, or I think I think it was very early eighties. I think yeah. it was like eighty three, and I'm still, still traumatized by it. I think wasn't Bay Arthur on there? Who wasn't? It was terrible. Anyway, it was just terrible. But um, you know, perhaps we should do a um. Uh, um, an off-the-cuff journal club one of the days. As, yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, no further questions, my lord. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, you're American. No further questions, Your Honor. Uh, I think we did away with titles during the revolution, but somehow they're creeping back. Oh, it's always uh, it's always Malud over here when you're addressing a judge, a high court judge. Yes, Malud. Sit, yeah, Malud. 
Uh, okay, I'm. I know I'm looking spaced out because I'm trying to slowly scroll across this paper slowly, um, because, because it's lagging and trying to get to the next figure here before I switch gears and turn turn it over. Sounds like you need a bit more ATP, Oliver. My computer needs more ATP. That's why I drink lots of. That's why I drink lots of coffee. So uh, because that inhibits mTOR. So you know, allegedly, it has some. Uh, it has some benefits. So yeah, coffee. Coffee's a gero protector, in moderation. Mm. Um, anyway, I've been trying to. Uh, my stomach's been a little upset because uh, all Thursday I've been retching uh, due to some kind of stomach virus. I'm much better now. But uh, I'll spare you the gory details. Um, yes, I don't really want to discuss your microbiome. Yeah. Um, perhaps uh, perhaps Mike Luscott might might want to have that conversation with you, but uh, I ain't going there. <laughs> okay, so on to the next one. Hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, oh, uh, is it, see it now? Good. Yeah, there it is. There it's worked. Yeah. I, I get the Apple, uh, the Mac lollipop of death. That's what I call it. Just a little spinning lollipop. Yeah, I'm, my computer, I get a little wheel, that a little bubbly wheel thing that goes around. I think it's called an aero. It goes around. Oh. And go, oh, God, it's about to collapse. Okay, so... um. So figure five, uh, they're looking at, I believe, an alternative pathway to the regulation of AMPK, which is via calcium signaling. Um, and uh, so they mentioned in the paper that, uh, you know, that trying to pull up the reference here. Um, But there's also, uh, so not only can you have AMPK mediated signaling that is affected, but you can potentially have calmodulin uh, or CAMKK, -A -A another kinase that's calcium dependent uh, that's uh, affected. And, um, and this is, I believe, a, I'm trying to think, is it CAMKK2? Is that a... It's, I think it's a calmodulin dependent kinase. Yeah. What is, what is it uh, phosphorylating downstream? I, uh, I think it's AMPK, right? It's a uh, spin of AMPK. So, okay, so it's kind of parallel to AMPK? Like it's, down, it's affecting TOR as well? Well, it's upstream of AMPK. So oh, it's upstream. Then, okay. Yes, then it okay. will also be inhibiting mTOR to AMPK. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, so, they're looking at cytosolic calcium levels. And um, according to this, J147 modulates resting calcium homeostasis to activate the AMPK mTOR axis. Um, and I'm not sure how it's affecting calcium homeostasis um, other than uh, they're using some sort of fluorescent dye to measure cytosolic calcium levels. Um, this is vehicle. Uh, this other compound, I believe, is probably a positive control of sorts. And increasing levels of K147 causes the fluorescence levels to go up significantly, according to these little stars here. Um, I'm not sure exactly how J147 is supposed to be increasing calcium levels, to be honest with you. Um, with figure B in cortical neurons, again, the brain is getting hazy here, lack of coffee, STO, you guys remember what STO, sorry, I would normally look this up, but this damn thing is scrolling so slowly, STO609 and plus, plus and minus STO609. Uh, is a calcium calmodulin dependent kinase inhibitor. Ah, thank you. So I guess this is the comparison to see. This is sort of the equivalent of doing the siRNA and showing that it's having a similar effect to J147, but here they're using not just J147, but they're using uh, 
you said it's an inhibitor. Yes, it's an inhibitor. Inhibitor of of the of the uh, the cam KK. Yes. And they're looking at uh, what would happen to the phosphorylation status of basically the same proteins that we looked at above um, over a period of time, hours, and by inhibiting, you know, this upstream kinase that's calcium dependent, you get no full relative changes uh, versus normally you don't have an inhibitor, you get these changes. Um, and again, this is all normalized, or this is compared to zero, and again, normalized to actin, you know, or it has to be actin, right, because this is your loading control. Um, so again, my caveat here is that you really have to be careful when you actually compare these blobs because, you know, you're, you're, you're basically looking at intensities, right, and showing that these intensities are changing and that they're changing not because of slight differences in concentration in each well, but that they're legitimate changes or fluctuations between cells. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't see any error bars here, so I'm not sure how many samples this is really, right? It's, I guess this is just one sample because it's just one. I mean, they have error bars in these guys, but not here. So um, I take that what you will, um, you know, calcium dependent signaling is required and it's upstream. And, you know, according to this, abrogating this is going to cause no changes in uh, phosphorylation status. Um, and what are they looking at here? J147, percent survival in 2.5 millimolar glutamate and J147 concentration is dependent on AMPK. So it's similar to the assays we looked at in, in previously, but here they just look at AMP kinase knockout fibroblasts. So they look at some cells, cell line that has AMPK basically knocked out and wild type fibroblasts um, and basically show that, you know, adding in more and more J147 um, is not going to have any protective effect if you have no AMPK whatsoever, right? Um, now that, that, that doesn't necessarily say that it's due to, you know, it acting through AMPK. Um, not you know, exactly sure if that's the take home message you can have. Um, other than the fact that if you have no AMPK, the cells perform pretty badly in 2.5 millimolar glutamate. Um, question is if, could these cells be, could the survival be enhanced by something other than J147 that doesn't act through the amputinous pathway or do you need that to survive in 2.5 millimolar glutamate? So this is supposed to add, I guess, a little bit more, a little bit more data suggesting that J147 is acting through AMP kind of signals. Okay, okay. And last but not least, we start looking at lifespans, which is. That's uh, what most of us are here for, right? Yeah. Um, and they actually do, you know, metabolomic studies and um, total genomic drift studies. So basically, they do transcriptome analyses, right? They basically they basically look at differences between young and old, um, and they look at, you know, in this case, phosph phosphorylated AMPK levels in um, the hippocampus of these. Um, I think these are accelerated aging mice. S A M P. Yeah. Um, I don't know what their what their actual genotype is. It's I guess they have a accelerated accumulation of amyloid well, plaque or something. Well, that's one of the things. But um, the mice were actually made by just like crossing a lot of different mice together, and then they got like a panel of different senescence accelerated mice, mm -hmm. uh, and that was done like you know many decades. Uh, well, not decades, but two decades or whatever ago. Um, and uh, we, I, I don't know if anyone knows exactly, you know, why they are accelerated aging. It wasn't done by any specific mutations. It was just, you know, phenotypic screen for lifespan. 
And one of the things indeed is that they seem to have like a, a neural degeneration, I think. Mm. So they see, they're trying to see now, uh, well, um, does this actually do any kind of changes uh, to, these, to these mice? Um, and here you see basically this is, um, I guess these are biopsies from the hippocampus and they do western blots and then they look at relative changes, young and old. So um, I think these are probably different mice, each of these lanes. Um, I'm not sure, I have to take a look. Um, that, that, that would make the most sense statistically. Um, but basically what you see here, just even glancing at this, you could see that you, you have, you know, adding in J147 seems to, you know, um, get the phosphorylation status back up, you know, at least through a larger cohort um, to the young, right? And this is basically just a, a bar, bar graph interpretation of what you're seeing up here and that it's statistically significant. Um, and then... This genomic drift and this drift suppression of mitochondria-related processes, you know, and they talk about all of these metabolic processes and homeostasis. Um, I have to take a look and see how they measured all of these uh, different variables because this is just looking at transcriptome analysis and this is log fold suppression. So basically, you know, um, adding this compound, is it going to make things look, is the profile going to look young, basically? That's, that's the bottom line. Um, you know, the take home message is yes, um, which is kind of weird. I mean, they look at the trends. So here in total genomic drift, they look at their control is three month old mice, and then they have another control 10 months and then J147, 10 months. Um, you know, the error bars, you know, they, they scrunch down a little bit, but I don't know. I mean, I've never seen P values like this in, in biology, 10 to the negative 40. I mean, that's pretty damn impressive. 10 to the negative 10. It's like some quantum physics level of like p values. Um, I mean, I mean, there's 916, there's 916 genes. Can you get a p value of 10 to the negative 40 from 916 genes, a transcriptome analysis? I mean, the error bars are, are pretty close too. I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I didn't look at the actual statistical analysis, but man, 10 to the negative 40, that's some high confidence. Um, usually you end up seeing things like 0.02, which is, you know, 0. 0.0001 maybe, but I don't think I've ever seen 10 to the negative 10 or 10 to the negative 40 as a p-value in a biology paper. I mean, that's like what, like three billion mice or something like that? I don't know. But um, the p-values are what they are. And um, this is statistically significant in that, you know, uh, you have, you know, um, it's, it's crunching down this genomic drift, it's basically, you know, the trans this, this spread of transcriptomes, you know, like that, that happens over a period of time where things are being mistranscribed is getting more normalized or slightly more normalized or whatever that level is. Again, it ties in with, um, uh, just to chip in, it, it, again, it ties in with um, caloric restriction. There was a study out late last year that shows that epigenetic drift is considerably slowed down by uh, caloric restriction mm -hmm. so again it makes sense it makes total sense that um it's going to be correct in that epigenetic drift mm -hmm. so yeah you you could you could either starve yourself or or take j147 and eat yourself silly yeah well <laughs> maybe i'm still yeah I'm still dwelling on the, those numbers, 10 to the negative 40. That's a lot of zeros. Hmm. Okay. A significant, significant change, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's um, kind of like, like caloric restriction 
supercharged, you, you know? Right. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, I mean, just the error bars themselves don't look that impressive to me. I mean, there's a lot of overlap here. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, um, I'm just going to skip to the lifespan right here. Um, and they now basically uh, feed J147 to fruit flies. So they give it to Drosophila, and the control is ethanol, which is, I believe, the carrier in this case, probably, for J147. And they get an increase in both maximal and average lifespan, which is significant. Not, you know, um, mind-blowingly so, but reproducibly so, about 10%. Pretty good if you're a pretty good if you're a fruit fly though. To be fair, yeah, sure. I mean, what do they live? Six, seven days. Uh, they could live a lot longer than that. Months if they're, or many, many months if they're bred by uh, Michael Rose. Well, and they get drunk at the same time, so they are happy. Yeah. It's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, speaking as a gardener, a lifelong gardener, I don't particularly like fruit flies and things like that. Yeah. And so, then, hmm. then, you know, then to kind of, you know, cut their lives short and for the name of science, uh, they, they crush their little heads and they measure ATP levels and fly heads here. And, uh, Lovely. they show that the ATP levels are significantly increased, uh, by addition of 0.1 micromolar of J147. Um, Yeah. So again, that correlates to the earlier figures they showed where you get a slight increase in ATP levels, uh, even though you're inhibiting, uh, you know, it could be, it could be that uh, you're inhibiting ATP synthase, but then you're slowing down protein production. So there's a net, you know, not like you're not using enough ATP, as much ATP. So maybe you have enough leftover ATP. That could be why you have those higher levels of ATP, right? Even though you're, you're, you know, um, you know, you're, you're basically, I guess, yeah, slowing down ATP synthase act activity in general. I'm not quite, quite sure. Um, well, it's a general slowing of the metabolism, isn't it? And it's, you, you see, so I'm going to keep talking about caloric restriction here and, and other approaches, things that influence the ISS pathway, which is, one of the other four metabolic pathways. Whenever you put the brakes on on that, it slows overall metabolism. Therefore, you you don't grow as fast. So you know it's like live fast, die young, or the opposite. Yeah. Well, live slow, die old. Yeah. Well, this 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 paper pointed a lot of novel directions. Um, I'd love, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of follow-up work now trying to connect AMP tour signaling uh, to neurodegeneration, um, you know, based on the directions this paper's pointed. You know, I'd like to kind of see that cemented uh, quite a bit more. Um, but if that holds up, you know, that, uh, that, that, uh, if, if that holds up, then, you know, that, will kind of, you know, add more kind of structure to, um, to all of the prevailing theories that are out there for the interconnectedness of, um, of mechanisms that are, have evolved to, you know, to slow down aging and to promote longevity and how all of this is uh, interconnected. So I guess that's all I have to say. So the the verdict is it's um, what, what about it the the verdict in general as a potential treatment for Alzheimer's obviously that was the main purpose of the paper I mean yeah I didn't good. yeah I didn't see I didn't read the I didn't read the earlier papers where they actually found the compound so uh, clearly you know one of the you know uh, clearly one of the you know the keys always with these drugs is are they going to get through the blood brain barrier right because you, you need this to to, to get where it needs to work. And if it's going to be affecting mitochondrial bioenergetics, you clearly want it to be working at neurons. So if, if that's the case, you know, I mean, like with any drug, right? Like what's the, what's the side effect profile? You know, whatever, you know, what's the toxicity of this thing? Cause you know, um, 
is it uh, if the toxicity profile is good and it you know gets to the neurons it's supposed to get to, then it looks very promising. Yeah, the um, the the previous tests the um, they used um, a, is it peritoneal injections where they inject into the cavity. Mm-hmm. Uh, the body cavity yeah. that they, they used that with the mice in the I think it was 2011. That's how they injected it, which suggests it penetrates oh. the BBB. But at the end of the day, even if it doesn't get through the brain brain blood barrier, I mean there there are ways and means, aren't there? I mean, in a, an intracranial injection, yeah. you know, I'd rather have a needle stuck up my nose into my brain. I know yeah. it sounds grim. Sorry about that, um, but I'd rather have that than Alzheimer's. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that being said, if, if, you know, if, even if it doesn't have an effect on Alzheimer's, this, this paper suggests that, uh, it will affect other cells beneficially, right? So it can prevent. So, uh, I don't know if the other papers looked at other types of degeneration that happen, you know, with aging and age cells. I don't know if mm-hmm. there's been other models other than Alzheimer's models that J147 has been applied to, um, I think it has been applied to a couple of other um, conditions. Yeah. Um, I, I can't quite for the life of it. Let me just double check. You'd have thought I'd remember this, really, because I actually wrote about it a couple of weeks ago, but my memory is um, shocking. Maybe uh, I need some J147, Oliver. Perhaps. <laughs> I'm just I'm just double checking now because I'm sure I mentioned it. They have... I'm trying to think now. Now, I know they've tested it on at least two of the types of um, disease. I can't think of me for the life of me which which they are, but they have they have uh, not necessarily them, but people have looked at the utility for other diseases. Um if anything, I would have thought it would have been beneficial for other amyloid based diseases. Sure. So you know, ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, and then p- potentially elsewhere in the body. I mean, I'd like to see some, you know, data for things like atherosclerosis, for example. I mean, you know, w- would it influence that? It's an amyloid disease or am- and uh, amyloidosis as well, the one that tends to um, kill super sanitarians, yeah. centenarians, sorry. But yeah, I'm I'm definitely interested in it. Uh, we'll find out soon because it's going into human uh, phase one, isn't it? Oh, really? Very good. Yeah, yeah. They've uh, they they've passed the FDA required toxicity uh, tests uh, in animals, and it's essentially poised now at the stage where it's going to then jump into phase one. I should imagine if it hasn't already they'll be applying for an IND, in which case, if that's approved, it will go to phase one. So we're, we're not talking about a, um, a tremendous amount of time, um, really, are we? You know, I think it would probably be fair to say that if the IND is approved by the FDA, we could potentially even see that going into human trials within, you know, within the year easily. Well, yeah, well, that's something to look forward to. Um, it Obviously. is. Um, so, you know, any, anything that will give us the edge and new approaches to Alzheimer's is, is a good thing. You need to start looking at the root, and I've, I've noticed this, not just for Alzheimer's, but other, uh, other approaches, but, uh, you know, for other diseases. A lot more researchers seem to be suggesting that we should target the aging processes. You know, I've seen this now two or three times just in this new year that researchers are more and more calling upon target the aging processes if you want to treat the diseases, things like cancer, Alzheimer's, all your favorites, all the top uh, aging diseases, we could head them off at the past potentially. But it just echoes what Aubrey's, uh, Aubrey de Grey has been saying and, and other people like, like Aubrey for years. And now it's starting to fall into place. Kind of cool. I hope it. I hope it pans out. I do. Well, well, so far so good. So far, I I, I see the. You know, I've been in this field uh, starting as a PhD student in 2000, and uh, there's more and more pieces that are falling into place. 
um, that, you know, um, it's, it's I'm not going to say we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but there's more, more, um, more pieces of, are linking together and we're seeing the picture, I think. And, um, and I have confidence that, that the picture that we have are forming now um, is, is the correct one. Yeah, I, th- I think so. Um, it's been a long time coming, but I think we're going to get scientific um, consensus um, before too long now on what on what aging is or isn't. Um, one of the big questions for me, I know it's a slight tangent, but really we need to settle the the matter about DNA damage. Is it is it significant in our in human current lifespan, and also the role of epigenetics in aging? Is it a cause or is it a consequence? Yeah. For me personally, I think it's a cause. Yeah. And I think we're going to find out soon. And then everything's going to come into place. And everything's going to get, get you know, start really, really sort of moving along. That's what I think anyway. Excellent. Well, um, that was another stimulating journal club. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, we have no more questions. Uh, it's uh, almost 2.40 right now here in New York City. Um, I think we'll adjourn for the day. And we'll, uh, sorry for the delay in the journal club. We were supposed to do it last week, but I had a faculty meeting that popped up, so we had to push that up. And um, next one, we should, I don't know, we should have it on schedule, I guess, probably at the end of the month, something like that. That would be, um, if that's the case, that would be the 27th of February. So you get two journal clubs for the price of one in February, even yeah. though this is technically the January one today. Um, well, that okay. can't be bad. And we've got an AI versus aging panel coming up as well, um, which, which is something to look forward to. When is well. that again? Because I think I'm supposed to be part of that. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not what you, that's not what I wanted to hear, Oliver. But yes, you 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 are actually going to be the chair of that event. Oh, oh, oh okay. And um, we have the Mouse Age team, including uh, some of the leading lights in AI research, and. It's actually on uh, the, the the day it's on is February the twenty first, which is also the day of Jean Clamont, uh, who is the oldest uh, person in history with the longest lifespan. Longest, well, yes, was she lived to just over one hundred and twenty two years old, and proved and, and debunked all those silly articles about one hundred and fifteen being the limit. Clearly not right. And yeah, so yeah, so you that's beat all it. coming up. You yeah. beat it, me to it, uh, Steve, because yeah. Victor asked me to just promote Calmos. The uh, <laughs> so make sure everyone to take a picture of yourself with some of her favorite foods: chocolate, olive oil, maybe some port wine, uh, and then post that on your Facebook profile, and you know inform your friends and family who are not yet into the aging field about the need to uh, to do aging research. That's it. And then crack open a bottle of wine, enjoy some chocolate, and listen to the soothing voice of Oliver as he hosts our panel about aging research and the role of AI in how AI is going to defeat aging. Or, or, maybe. Or, or take over the world and kill us, one of the two. Oh, dear. Yes, I'm sure we'll cover that topic as well. <laughs> the reality versus um, versus the hype versus hollywood okay, but that's guys. all great so thanks for coming everybody thanks for tuning yep. in and just a quick note this is uh this show runs thanks to the contribution of our monthly heroes our lifespan heroes and for which we are very grateful and we will see you next time <laughs>